I'm going to start with some thoughts uh, because we are at a crossroads in the wider field of visual communication. And I'm using again visual communication uh, without a lot of confidence because exactly it's not very clear what this, the limits of this field are. But what we have is a growing field where people study related disciplines. There's quite a lot of diversity in different kinds of professional practice. There's a lot of different education systems and at different levels that people have access to. There's some body of critical research that a lot of it is being published in a quite a different range uh, of uh, journals and a growing record of funded projects that inform this research. There's also quite a lot of change in skills practice. So we're having a field that relates to practice that is changing very dynamically. It responds a lot to technological and use conditions. Uh, especially in developing parts of the world, it follows very closely the growth of urbanization and the rising of middle classes, changing of patterns in consumerism, so we can track very quickly how different kinds of design respond to these conditions. And of course, schools are racing to uh, keep up with these challenges. The terminology is quite important because we find that people referring to what we do as graphic design might feel that this is too closely connected to ideas about applied practice and not necessarily respecting the more methodologically serious aspects of the discipline. They might not put the user at the center. They might not put the content at the center of practice. Therefore, we see a lot of changes to using terms like visual communication, uh, things that relate to usability, and so on. And there's quite a lot of regional differences there. What we do know is that almost all of the courses that used to be called graphic design and want to attract, let's say, a higher level of students often drop the term graphic design and tend to go for graphic communication, visual communication, and so on. So that is a trend internationally. There is also a question of the relationship of our discipline to the humanities. It is not uh, a surprise that we are collocated here in a faculty that also has architecture, which is also a very applied discipline, but also has its uh, connections with things like engineering, physics, urban development, social studies, and so on. So the methodologies in architecture are actually quite similar to the methodologies in typography. And certainly, they would draw on uh, work in uh, historical archives, in studying the history of the discipline, as well as usability, and so on. All of these things bring into them techniques that come from the wider spectrum of the humanities and social sciences. So this defines very much our field as a field that is at the heart of an interdisciplinary nexus. That raises quite a few challenges. And I've got I've narrowed it down to sort of six plus one key challenges. Uh, one is the discipline boundaries and the terminology. And I hinted already at this thing, that we often don't know what we're talking about when we talk about typography. Uh, do we talk about the design with letters? Oh. And so the light from above shines on my words. Uh, do we talk about the design with letters? Uh, in a lot of institutions, you will find a typography project being a poster that has letters on it. Uh, in another institution, a typography project might be something that involves text-intensive content, which would essentially be paragraphs and small text. There might be or might not be some relationship to practical projects and briefs, clients and budgets, techniques of production or not, depending on the environment. The terminology, again, is something that is hugely variant across the world. And it especially has to do with the weight of historical ways of making and the problem of English. And I say the problem of English because English is like the elephant in the room where a lot of new terminology is generated. A lot of the people who are more formally educated throughout the world tend to have easier access to the English terminology and that, that gets imported uh, into other regional markets. So I would not be surprised if I were uh, sort of, uh, eavesdropping in discussions in an agency in Colombo and the word marketing or branding popped up. And if I ask people, well, what's the local version for marketing or branding, they'd say marketing and branding. And this is not uh, unique at all. This is pervasive. You also find problems in a lot of uh, languages with uh, the practice being um, carried out without the need for an explicit terminology. 
Uh, a very good example for this is with Spanish and the word typographias, which means the letter forms, rather than typography as the specification of text, which doesn't exist as an equivalent term of its own. But people do specify texts in a Spanish-speaking language, so therefore the practice does exist, but there is a deficit in the terminology. So that is something that is increasingly happening and becomes more so when we have to integrate our practice with people from a mostly technical background, which comes with a fairly well-developed idea of terminology. So that is a burden on us to explain what it is that we're doing. Uh, there is another problem in this, and that has to do particularly with English, and I could not find a better gray old man than Stanley Morrison to illustrate this, because a lot of the terminology that we have and the methods for historiography are very northwestern European. And they were often written by people from very specific communities and very specific perspectives. That doesn't mean that all the terminology they developed is wrong, but it usually means that what they wrote about is very narrow. So they had a very narrow idea of what typography is. If you look at a lot of the printing history written by people like Morrison, it's mostly about books and often just title pages of a specific kind. You might not get any reference to newspapers or ephemera or the kind of documents that people produce in their daily lives because that was not serious enough. Therefore, you don't have the terminology, you don't have the text that describe these things and so on. This is a deficit not only international, but also in a core language that only creates a very partial view. So even in areas where we think we have some terms that we can use, actually they are not reliable and they need to be questioned. Then there is the need of things that keep changing. And uh, I return often to this uh, quote by Jeff Keady uh, from uh, the early 90s, where he's stressing the point that it is really important to keep an awareness of historical developments of how the past was carried out, but also be very open to how current practice and changes in conditions change. Our practice, our way of seeing things, and so on. And there underlines the, the problem that typography is, by its nature, a very dynamic discipline. It changes quite a lot and at a speed that often maps exactly onto changes in social structures and behaviors. So it's quite volatile, and education by its nature is much slower than this. A second uh, problem has to do with our body of reference works and sources. Again, if I look at an engineering discipline like the Vice Chancellor mentioned earlier, I can point at a small shelf that will have the key text that I need to find out uh, about and read if I'm studying engineering. The same thing in typography doesn't apply. What we have is a lot of different things con contributing to our knowledge. And this could be practice, could be instructions, manuals, and so on. It could be collections of things, uh, things that have pictures of stuff, uh, indirect records of things. Then you can have historical accounts, which might be quite personal and subjective. Uh, they might be collections of evidence without any critical thinking into them. You have a lot of specifications for practice, manuals for how to do things, instruction materials, and so on. You might have a lot of narratives where people are actually retelling how they've done things. They might try to explain perspectives for their motivations. And you have some sort of theory making at the top, which is not necessarily uh, formulated well enough. In reality, however, we don't have this. What we have is this. We have a huge amount of practice, which is dominating our perceptions. And then we have things on top that are trying to eke a little bit of attention out. This is quite a distortion. And the problem with this is that it uh, distorts the perspectives of people who are in administrations, people who are in funding bodies, people who are in all the environments that have to plan research environments. Uh, another problem has to do with the connection between the, uh, the volume of practice and the people who are teaching and training and also producing the research, that there might not be as established paths between those communities as there are in other disciplines. So if you're doing research in, I don't know, hydraulics, there is quite a big chance that this might feed into people who are practicing engineering and so on. It's not necessarily the case uh, in our field. Another thing has to do with uh, the integration of archives and user data. Uh, what we do know 
is that there are significant lessons from the past that can inform our understanding of the present and help us make better choices in the future. And they start by looking at things, and I'm just drawing on some examples of what people are doing here uh, at Reading, uh, but also that is only half the story, because looking at stuff on its own is not, in, not very helpful. Uh, yes, there's a problem in actually getting access to this stuff, but then how do you look at things? Do you look at things individually or do you compare? In this case, uh, we have uh, students comparing the designs by two different typeface designers for typefaces from slightly different periods, different type-making technologies, and also different approaches to what design is. That is something that gives a different sense of understanding to the students rather than looking at specific uh, instances of one designer only. Uh, this is an extreme case of this. This is um, archive musical chairs that we do with students, where we have a range of objects exhibiting specific kinds of typographic problems, and students spend a small amount of time, just about three to four minutes in front of each, making specific observations and then very quickly jumping on to the next one. So then, within about an hour, an hour and a half, they have exposed themselves to quite a lot of different kinds of typography, and they've informed themselves about ways of dealing with these typographic problems, whereas their own personal experience might not bring them into this. Then, of course, the problems have to do with research methodologies. What is a standard visual communication education doesn't necessarily include training for methodologies for asking questions, for being critical in your reading of sources, for setting up experiments, for polling user data, and so on. All of that stuff is missing. There are very notable examples in history of specific pockets of practice that had user testing aligned to them. Uh, the motorway signals are a very good case, but also a lot of work that has to do with legibility and readability. These bring a lot of questions in that I think designers would need to be aware of. And in this case, not only what does the results of the test tell you, but to be able to interrogate how was the test planned, what is the bias, conscious and unconscious, of the experimenters, what are the limitations in conducting an experiment that is something that you need to be aware of, and of course the wider discussions, in this case in the social sciences, about repeatability of experiments and the trustworthiness of any experiments that involves human beings. Then there's issues that have to do with where does your research happen? Publication formats and channels are hugely varied and they're not as well established in our discipline as they are in others. You might get things that look like serious academic publications that you can bet hard cash that no practitioner would ever read. Not least because they don't have the access to the journals. They might only have institutional library subscriptions or they might be very expensive or the format of the publication and the language is such that it excludes practitioners. Usually there won't be any pictures in an article that talks about visual things, which is an odd way of seeing things. You might get something that is published online, it might be quite serious or significant, uh, but that is not part of an edited environment perhaps, or it doesn't have a critical uh, environment in which to be peer reviewed. It might not get referenced in citation indexes that matter for the uh, accreditation of publishers and so on. So you might have important ideas hidden either in fairly exclusive academic networks or in things that have to compete in a very busy social environment. You then might have uh, instances uh, like conference presentations which allow ideas to reach practitioners and especially if they're recorded online. They might do quite a few more but then they do not count as output. They're not really research output in themselves. In a conventional academic environment, these are avatars for a published piece of text that will happen in a serious academic journal like the one I showed earlier. So there are significant challenges with this that I think we have to face. And of course, I mentioned Kidi earlier. Things like this. this is an article that 20 years later whom I think is actually quite relevant in these ideas, but if, because it was published in emigrates, or just what would be considered a trade magazine or for professionals, it is not necessarily indexed in anything that counts for research accreditation, and certainly it does not count as research output for a lot of institutions. So you find these kind of problems where significance might not be associated with specific channels. And of course then, very good cases, you have things like this, publications in iMagazine, another um, professional 
publication, a trade publication, where you might have fairly critically important texts. There is a very well-established editorial environment there. So there is the sense of peer review in the text, but again, it is not something that will count very much for an author's, um, say, research accreditation. There is a hidden question there, again, with quite a lot of work that goes on uh, at the PhD level, uh, master research and PhD level in typography, that a lot of the PhDs are not widely accessible. This is a particularly a difficult problem because a lot of the work in our field might draw on material that is in collections, in libraries, and so on, where for the specific object that is a PhD that gets deposited for an examination, the student has the right for fair use of the images, but once that thing is done, then there's no right to publish these images online. And that is a really difficult problem because a lot of institutional depositors will not then allow an edited version of the thesis to be published with perhaps some images omitted and so on. So the knowledge that was generated by that PhD, which might be quite substantial, is actually not available publicly. There is a secondary uh, dimension to this, which has to do with open data, that what happens to the data that is collected during the PhD. And that, again, ideal would be somewhere accessible, so you can see uh, what resources a researcher has drawn on to do this. There is an equivalent call for openness in the data collection across disciplines, but in our field it's also quite particular because a lot of these archives are not properly catalogued or are quite difficult to access and so on. So PhDs could offer a very good vehicle for these kind of collections to be made more widely documented and shared, but it is a particular problem at the time. So there are specific issues in there that our disciplines are still shaping themselves. We don't have a very clear idea of how we relate to other disciplines. We don't have a very clear idea of which are the key sources, the things that you definitely need to read to have access to the knowledge that is essential for specific flavors of our discipline. We don't have an integration of archives and methodologies for doing this as a common understanding. This has changed quite a lot in recent years and I should say because of a lot of the impact of what we do at Reading, we see now a lot of courses taking students to national libraries, to collections, and looking at material. There's new institutional archives being put together. And that is a great start. But then again, you need to have the methodologies for interrogating the archives within the staff. You need to have the expertise to ask the right kind of questions. And also to explain to the students who might think that they're working in a practical discipline that this is an integral part of how they build their decision making. So it's quite a complex thing that needs to feed into the whole of the educational plan rather than something that's an add-on just as so you can say you can look at old stuff. Research methodologies, critical writing and thinking. This is something that is not necessarily part of design education at the moment. And especially if you think of the average bachelor's graduate, they will have done a fairly small amount of writing. They might not have been trained in dealing with critical skills, writing and interrogating arguments, and so on. And this is something that is missing and has a lot to do with perceptions of the field as a practical discipline or applied discipline, which actually downgrades quite a lot the expectation that people could have of the average graduate, whereas in reality we know that these people move on and do quite innovative things in practice. They might engage with other disciplines and produce knowledge in themselves. So the education and training in research by the staff and sponsored by institutions first needs to happen so that this cascades down into teaching plans, educational programs, and so on. And that is something that takes quite a bit of time and persistence, but it is integral to our field establishing itself properly. I mention this particularly because the greatest obstacle often is the perceptions within academic institutions themselves. The idea of our discipline's relation to other disciplines that might have to do with applied practice, architecture again, here's a very good example, uh, are very deeply held and often color very much availability for funding, uh, the attitude to building resources that help uh, students build research skills, and so on. Funding bodies, again, they need also to be educated about the contribution that typography can make into a society and the responsibility to provide this more research-intensive uh, framework for training, 
in disciplines that affect, in return, the culture further down the line. Industry partners, again, are quite important in this because exactly they often come from the technology side. We tend to focus on fairly task-based subjects, whereas uh, typography can offer a way to integrate cultural considerations in something that is quite task-orientated. So we do need to put together a framework for inquiry that will integrate uh, a different way of thinking in design studies. And these are simple things that we can bring together. That there has to be training, critical thinking and writing uh, at all levels in design education. Students need to be able to express themselves well, but with rigorous arguments and by drawing not only on their own powers of reasoning, but on the literature in the area. To share openly uh, reference lists and how to put together trustworthy sources for specific areas of the discipline. Then. Establishing methods for integrating the context, and this could be historical material, this could be users, this could be business considerations or technology considerations. There's quite a lot of variation in how people do this, which means that there is not a very clear consensus on how people should do this. And I think this is something that uh, our industry needs, our sector needs to move quite forward in. ATIP has a critical role in this because we do bring these communities together, but I think there's much more work to do. Then making publications uh, an integral part of what we do. So designers who not only speak about design, but designers who can write about design and see it as part of their practice to write. Again, I refer to architecture as something where publication about significant works is seen as an integral part of practice. And it would not be uh, at all odd if in a, in a good architecture practice you see subscriptions to several architectural journals. That would be seen as the thing you do. You keep yourself up to speed with what is going on in research and practice in your field. And then the idea that because our field is changing so quickly, you do extend uh, constant opportunities for training and learning within people's careers. Uh, that includes educators and, of course, professionals. That it is impossible to say that the skills you've learned within three or four years of education will be current 20 years from now, especially in a field where education changes, sorry, practice changes so quickly because of the rapid technology change and changes in society, it would be hubris to think that what I learned 25 years ago is current now. So I think this idea of constant learning, but institutionalized through our environments of learning is quite central. And I think it's really important to make as much as possible uh, our ways of working, our content openly available. Again, this is something that a lot of older institutions might not like very much. There are a lot of attitudes about protecting academic knowledge, but I think methodologies of learning, techniques, tasks, uh, reference lists, uh, as much as possible, the content of courses should be online available freely. And that would help transform the field. So I've given you uh, my summary of thoughts on the subject. I think these, plan, uh, these plug into quite a lot of other discussions we can have, and I look forward to having uh, a very vibrant Q&A on this and hope we continue more uh, the discussion over the two days. Uh, during the workshop we'll have later, we'll try to put some of these um, ideas into practice with a specific exercise. Thank you very much.